ะลำดับต่อไปเราจะเข้าสู่ช่วงของ Panel Discussion ค่ะเรามีวิทยากรแล้วก็ผู้ดำเนินรายการด้วยกันถึง5ท่านด้วยกันนะคะเพื่อเป็นการไม่เสียเวลาขอแนะนำท่านแรกกันเลยค่ะท่านแรกนะคะวิทยากรของเราคือคุณแมทธิวพาผู้อำนวยการโรงเรียนนานาชาตินาโกยาประเทศญี่ปุ่นวิทยากรท่านที่2ค่ะดรซุนชิกมินประธานกรรมการบริหารโรงเรียนนานาชาติเกาหลีส่วนท่านที่3ค่ะคุณมาตินาซาวเวิร์นเชิญผู้อำนวยการโรงเรียน2ภาษานานาชาติไทยนานประเทศไต้หวันและวิทยากรท่านสุดท้ายคือคุณพิชคุณเพชรสุดาเกตประยูนประธานบริหารโรงเรียนอำนวยศิลป์โรงเรียนส่งเสริมการคิดแห่งแรกในเอเชียประเทศไทยค่ะและผู้ดำเนินรายการของเรานะคะผู้ช่วยศาสตราจารย์อัตพลอัตนันตวรสกุลจากภาควิชาหลักสูตรและการสอนคณะครุศาสตร์จุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยค่ะ Welcome back to the Thailand Educational Leaders Symposium 2015. After the refreshment break, let's continue with another interesting topic. This one is the panel discussion. Let me introduce our panelists. First, Mr. Matthew Parr, head of Nagoya School, Japan. Second, Dr. Sun Shikmin, Chair of the Boy Korea International School, Republic Korea. Third, Ms. Martina Sao Won Chen, Director of International Bilingual School at Tainan, Taiwan. And the last panelist is Ms. Pet Suda Ke Prayun, Chairman of a m n o i s i n School, Thailand, first singing school in Asia. And our moderator is Associate Professor at Tapon at Nan t a w a r a s k u n From Department of Curriculum and Instruction, Faculty of Education, s h i l a l o n g o n University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panelists and the moderator upon the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here today for the uh, panel discussion on the global citizenship education in school. And today we have four friends from four countries to share the lesson learned from their own experience. Uh, we have one hour for the presentation, and maybe we have 15 minutes for the Q&A session. So we will provide 15 minutes for the presentation for each presenter. Then. If you have got some question, you can write down in the note and send to the uh, moderator uh, to to the Q&A session in the last 15 minutes. So we start with Mr. Matthew Pa from Nagoya. Maybe I'll stand over here. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, a real honor, actually, to be here. Um, I'm really inspired by the passion of everybody here, really looking at education in Thailand, and I'm very humbled by everything that I'm hearing. So I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, I'm certainly not here as an expert. I'm simply from our school, and we're struggling with a lot of the issues that you're struggling with. And I'm just here to share something of our story and some of the questions that we have. And this is our school, Nagoya International School. Many of you have very, very big schools. Our school is a very small school. We only have about 350 students. Um, our school started. Was it yesterday? They said that technology is great until it doesn't work. <laughs> I remember that from yesterday. Could somebody move to the next slide, please? Ah, there we are. Oh, that was it. There we go. Our topic today is looking at connections, connections from school to the world, from school to companies to business to government to nonprofit, from school to community. We're very lucky because our school started as a community school. This was our school 50 years ago, and it was built because the parents needed a school for their children. It was a group of missionary families, of business families, of local bicultural mixed marriage families, and they needed an international school 
um, with the English medium curriculum for their families. And so it was a relationship between the parents, between the local government, we had support from the prefectural government, the national government, uh, other governments, the US government gave a lot of funding to buy our initial land, coming together to build a school for kids. And so our school comes from this idea of being a part of a broader community. But of course, we're very different now than we were 50 years ago. Here's our graduating class today. We're far more diverse. Nagoya is a far more international city in Japan than it was 50 years ago. We now have students from about 35 different countries. This is our graduating class, and you can see the flags behind them are the countries that they come from. It's not just decoration. Those are the flags of, of those children. And you can see our kids come from all over the world. A lot of our children come from um, Toyota, because Toyota City is right next to Nagoya. And so Toyota obviously is a big global company. And so a lot of our kids come from all corners of the globe and come together here to NIS. So what started as a very small local international community in Nagoya 50 years ago is now really a very global community. So that changes how we have to consider ourselves as a part of a, a community network, not just a school in isolation. So how do we serve that community and what does community relations look like? Well, I believe it needs to come to your mission as a school and what you believe in as a school and what that school represents to the people that it serves. And for us, this is why we're here. This is our school. Your school, I'm sure, has a reason to be where it is. Every school has that. This is what we do. Inspire and empower students to think creatively and critically, pursue lifelong learning, and contribute to the global community. So we have community in there. It's part of our mission. It's part of what we want to do as a school. Before I talk about how we do that, I think it'd be nice for you to see something about our school and the global community that makes our school. So we have a short video of one of the events that we have to celebrate our community. And it's not a professional video, so it's a little bit blurry at times, but it's one that one of the students made. So I want to share it with you. And as we're also from Japan, again, I would ask, please do not take a recording of the video. Please simply watch and get uh, an idea about our school. I'm really proud of our whole community for pulling together on this day, our Global Citizens Day. Uh, sometimes it's hard to take time out of the curriculum and to have a day like a Global Citizens Day. But you know, this is what we do as a school. This is our mission. Something like today helps us understand who we are. It helps us understand what binds us together, what we have in common, but also what makes us different and to value that diversity and to value the multiple perspectives that we bring to our world. A lot of learning happens in the classroom, but a lot of learning happens outside of the classroom because it's only when you put learning in the context of the real world that it makes sense and has meaning. And Global Citizens Day is a way that we can take that learning into the world. And the way we do that is through action, considering and pondering and wondering over some of the problems that face our world and how we might solve them. And we saw students today engaged in groups right across the school, puzzling over real problems of our world. And through that puzzling comes understanding, and from understanding comes identity and purpose. Okay, so Global Citizens Day is a now annual event, 2015. Uh, this year is our second time doing it. 
It was first proposed, proposed and led by our student president, Yatana, format. Uh, we've been using the recently signed UN goals for sustainable development and uh, those goals were signed only a couple of weeks ago by 193 different leaders of countries around the world at the UN in New York. So Global Citizens Day has been fantastic because it has allowed all of our students to join together to increase each other's awareness. It's days like this that we hope will result in us thinking about how we interact with the world and things changing at school because of that. you get to work with a lot of people like from different like nationalities I think that's like the one cool thing about international schools is that we have so many people from so many different backgrounds so like everyone can like like have their input on what they think about that global issue and what they think they could do in order to like raise awareness about it or like do something about it we students learn so much from our teachers and from our class. However, Global Citizens Day is one of those days when we are able to apply our knowledge learned from the classroom and apply it to the real world. But beyond that, it makes us look at ourselves as an individual and as a whole, which is essential for creating our identity, because it's our identity that makes us who we are. So I want to thank everybody, and I really do mean everybody, for creating such an amazing day. So I hope that helps you understand our school a little bit. Um, I don't know if you could hear, but Yatana, the student who was speaking, one thing she said was, there are things that the textbooks can't teach us. There are things that we can only learn about in the real world. And for us, that's where the community connection comes in because collaborating with community gives a context to learning. And you only learn when you learn in context. So for us, the community connection is not just about having fun days, it's about a deeper connection. And that's our challenge. How do we go beyond the four Fs of an international school? Food, festivals, flags, fashion. How do we go beyond those things at a surface level and have connections with the world so that kids can really understand. And perhaps you know this model, the iceberg model. It's quite a common way of thinking about culture and thinking about identity. There are things that we can see at the top, things like our food, facial expressions, language, festivals, and you could see that from the video. You could see kids waving their flags and celebrating their national dress and celebrating themselves. There are things you can see, but then there are much deeper things that you can't see. Uh, values, uh, sense of identity, uh, sense of self and individual, sense of group. Those things are really key. And it's only by having deep connections that you can help children to understand what lives beneath the waterline and what drives society 
and individuality. And that is true learning. So at our school, we're always thinking about how can we make connections with our community that are more than just a bus trip. You know, it's not tourism, it's learning. How can we turn it so it's not tourism, but it's learning? It's not just a, a superficial connection, but it's a deep connection. So for us, it starts in the classroom. It doesn't start by having a connection. The connection is a strategy. It starts in the classroom. It starts by having a curriculum that is full of questions. We don't want our children to answer questions. We want our children to question answers. It's not answering questions, it's questioning answers. Because when children start to do that, they start to actually puzzle about the world. You can't puzzle about something unless you challenge it, question it. So it starts in the classroom with questions, high-level questions. And as children start to understand their world, as they start to challenge and puzzle, they start to connect to their world. And so then you can start going out into the world through connections, through networks, to take learning in context. And as children go out into the world and they start collaborating and connecting with their community outside of school, they begin to understand themselves and their identity. Another way to think of it is this. Start with a question. Connect to that question through action, through engagement, through relating to the world outside of school, and from that, learning happens. So for us, again, the collaboration with our community is not the goal. It's a strategy, and it's a strategy that's linked to learning. So I want to give you an example, because I'm just talking at this kind of theoretical level. I want to show you what that might look like. I want to ask everybody, I know you have a notepad and pen, write down in 30 seconds, what does this word mean to you? Just write it down. This word, what does it mean to you? Write down your own idea. What does it mean to you? So this word is very, very important for everything that we do, perspective. Let me show you what this looks like in our school and how this links to community and collaboration. So here is an art class with a unit on perspective. This is junior high school. And this is what you would expect, perspective, how to draw with perspective, line and shape. So this is part of the unit, one piece of work. This is another piece of work, a little bit more advanced, still looking at this idea of perspective. Again, this is a technical uh, interpretation of that word. But let's look at perspective another way now. Same classroom, same children, but a few weeks later. This is perspective. So the score is 12 to 19. But it feels very differently if I'm the green team as opposed to if I'm the red team. That's perspective. So it's still the art class, and they've just learned about the technical aspect of perspective. Now they're thinking about other connotations of perspective. And then it goes a little bit deeper, because sometimes we can look at the same thing and have a different perspective. So a young couple in love, looking at the pathway ahead of their life, they're looking in the same direction, but they're seeing different things. They have different signposts on the way. Again, same art class, perspective. And it's asking children to begin to think about this sense of perspective. The big idea, it is possible for two people to look at the same thing, see it completely differently, and yet both be right. That's a huge idea. You can only test that idea by going into the world. Again, that's where the communication, collaboration comes in. However, it doesn't stop there, right? Because they could both be wrong. They could both think they're right, but maybe they're both wrong. Or maybe one of them is right and one of them is wrong. And the real skill is how do you know? How do you know if you're right or you're wrong? Or if it's, is it just perspective? And so when does perspective become prejudice? That's a huge question. When am I valid to say this is my perspective and when am I just prejudiced? So these are the questions that kids have to ask and wrestle with and challenge with. And it happens right across the curriculum. So this is Halloween. 
that's my son in the mask, by the way. And we said we were going to cancel Halloween. Halloween is cancelled. Here's a letter that came from a parent. It's not a real letter, but it's a, it's a letter and it says you shouldn't have Halloween because it's not fair to have an American festival in an international school and it's just about being silly and there's no learning. And so we went to the children and we said, look, we've got a letter. And there are some parents who really think we shouldn't have Halloween. And this is their perspective. And we said, we have to write a letter back to these parents to tell them why we think we should have Halloween, if you think we should. And so for the whole day, the children were discussing the different perspective of these parents and their view about Halloween. And at the end of the day, they wrote the letter. And yeah, we did have Halloween that year. But again, this is part of the curriculum perspective. And when kids begin to understand perspective, now you're ready to have a relationship outside of school. Now you're ready to go outside of school and try what that looks like because you can understand. Now it's not tourism anymore. It's not just going on a field trip. Now it's actually a human connection in the world outside of school. So these children are in a village high in the mountains where there are different perspectives about farming. Should we use traditional methods, which are slower and less efficient and less cost effective, but protect the environment and the way of life? Or should we use modern farming methods, which are quicker and more effective and more efficient, but erode something of who we are? And that is perspective. It lives in the gray. And now these children have a chance of really making a human connection so that the connection isn't tourism, it's learning. And we're gradually building up our network of people that we can do this with. So in this picture are all the friends that we have in our community, many very near and some further afield. People from business, from industry, from local government, from charities, from nonprofits. And we try to find ways to bring them into the classroom and to take the classroom into the world so that when we are building those networks, it's about the learning, not about just tourism or just connection for its own sake. And again, we're not experts, we're puzzling, we're wondering, but this is what we're trying to do in our school. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation, and you give some experience from the school in Japan, that uh, international school. Uh, then, uh, from Japan, we go through to the Korea experience. So, please give the hand to Dr. Min Sun Shik from the Korea International School, Republic of Korea. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, good morning. I'm very honored to be able to speak to you with other uh, distinguished uh, guest speakers here. I also thank Mr. Akson and his staff for the invitation and the generous support that I received to prepare for this presentation. Oops. It works. <laughs> Well, um, let me give you some historical perspective for you to understand better the Korean situation. First of all, I would like to mention the special relationship that Korea had with Thailand. You know, uh, the South Korea was attacked by North Korea in 1950, and 16 countries helped South Korea under the flag of United Nations. Thailand was one of the countries that helped us and supported us and that saved us. So uh, Thailand is one of the 16 blood brothers of South Korea. Thank you very much for that. Well, the, the war ended in 1953 Korea was left with nothing but people and the land. However, the Korean people put great emphasis on education. So, uh, even the Korean government budget for education is larger than defense budget, even if we are still faced with uh, North Korea. So, the thanks to the, the 
the emphasis on education, Korea rose from ashes to a member of G20 and OECD. Korea had to focus on international market because we had very small local market and we had no resources. So currently, Korean dependence on international trade for its GDP is over 100. That means our exports and imports combined divided by our GDP is over 100. Because of this strong economic dependence on international trade, there is a great need for global education. So currently, every year, more than 10,000 Korean students, sorry, more than 10,000 K through 12 Korean students are going abroad to study. And currently, there are more than 100,000 Korean students are studying abroad. The major destinations are United States, China, Japan, Canada, and the UK. There is also strong demand for international education within Korea because of the, the strong um, dependence on international trade. There are many foreign expats working in Korea, so they came with their families, so they need to educate their children. And also there are many Korean businessmen or scholars, they return to Korea with their children so that their children may have to go to international school because they, they started uh, in foreign countries when they were young. That's how we started Korea International School in year 2000. Currently, we have three campuses. One in Seoul, we offer K through nine education to about 100 students. And we have Pengyo campus, which is just south of Seoul. And we offer K through 12 education there. We have about 1,300 students studying there. And about five years ago, we opened another campus on the island of Jeju. You probably know about Jeju because of the, out of the Korean drama or soap opera. And uh, the, the Jeju campus is only one campus that Korean government allowed us to take any Korean students if they are academically okay. For the Seoul campus and Pangyo campus, we have a strong government restriction that we cannot accept Korean students unless they lived outside Korea for longer than three years before they come back to Korea. And Jeju is also an island so that uh, when they, we have many students, they have to live apart from their families. So we have a boarding facility. About half of our students at Jeju campus are boarders. So in addition to academic issues, we have many more issues to take care of those boarders at Jeju campus. Academically, we follow United States curriculum, and we are fully accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges in the United States. Well, um, you see uh, two photos. Uh, on the top is our Pengyo campus. We have uh, four main buildings. And on the bottom, it's a photo of our Jeju campus. Both campus, uh, it's about 10 acres large. And we have indoor swimming pool, indoor basket basketball courts, squash courts, performing arts center, and soundproof music practice room. In addition to these facilities, uh, at Pengyo campus, we have uh, prayer rooms for Islamic students. We have about 100 uh, students from Islamic countries. Our school is religious neutral, so we, we accept students regardless of their, their religion. But you know, for Islamic students, we have to provide a space for them to pray regularly during, even during the academic days. So that's, 
That's a special facility we offer at our uh, Pangyo campus. At Jeju, we don't have any Islamic students, so we don't have prayer room there. This is a, a mission of KIS. We try to inspire students with passion for learning and to cultivate competence, self-assurance, initiative, and creativity necessary for success in the global community. Uh, on the opening day of our first school, uh, on behalf of uh, the founding family, my father said, I wish the graduate of the KIS will become the UN Secretary General. It was before the current UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was elected. So we hope that KIS will continue to uh, uh, send a future uh, UN Secretary General. And these we have these five core values. First, I think you can read it, so save time, I can just, just uh, point out the, these five uh, values. First, global citizenship. You know, as an international school, we, we have to, to train the, teach the students for the global community that they will work in the future. And integrity, as you all understand, it, person should have a integrity, otherwise, whether he is a, has a good academic standing, he may not be regarded or considered as a good human being. And adaptability, it is, you know, the world is changing so that we need, students have to understand that they have to change according to the changes in their environment. And balance in life, I mean, I, we also emphasize they have to have a physical balance, they have to emotionally and socially ready to work with other people. And empowerment. We try, we, we want our graduates to be a leader in whatever they are, in the area, whatever they are doing in the future. So these five core values are those that we emphasize to our students. Well, uh, as I mentioned that we follow a US-based academic curriculum, and we also provide AP courses. As you may know, AP courses are very important to students if they want to apply to major U.S. universities and colleges. AP courses are the actually college-level courses that high school students can take, and they have to have a good rec grade from AP courses to get into top-notch U.S. schools. All of our uh, international school teachers have U.S. teacher certificate, and those teachers who teach AP subjects are all licensed to teach AP courses by educational testing services in the United States. Uh, let me just uh, briefly talk about the academic achievement. You know SAT. SAT is the test that students take to get into uh, American colleges and universities. And the, there are three areas, critical reasoning, mathematics, and writing. And the top score of each section is 800. So 2,400 is the top score of SAT. And uh, last year, the KIS graduate had an average of 2,036. And it is about top 10% of the percentile of SAT. And you know, uh, the average score of U.S. high school graduates of SAT score is only 1497. So, KS students have fairly uh, uh, high SAT score. 
Well, this is the uh, result of uh, the matriculation. I mean, last year we sent one to Harvard, uh, three to Princeton, uh, one to Columbia, three to UPenn, name a few. So uh, our performance was pretty good. And besides these uh, liberal arts colleges and universities, uh, many of our uh, graduates went to art art schools, design schools, and so and so. Besides the American colleges and universities, some of our graduates went to universities in Swiss, UK, Canada, and even to Japan. In addition, oh, sorry. In addition to uh, the academic strengths, we, would, we encourage our students to participate in extracurricular extra activities. I mentioned that uh, we have uh, five core values, and in order for them to uh, achieve the balance in life or global uh, adaptability, we strongly encourage them to be a part of the, the groups that we have for extracurricular activities. We have uh, model UN activities, we have debate competitions, sports activities, cultural events, and international service trips. Uh, the photo you see is a girl who is participating in the model UN uh, activity that was held in Shanghai last year. Well, a uh, couple of years ago, uh, our students came here to participate in uh, habitat activities. And as I mentioned that we encourage students to participate in those activities, but at the same time, we want to manage and control these activities as a, as a school. Can you click? Uh, Right. This is a web page where, I mean, school official web page where students and parents can look at what kind of activities are available. We actually discourage students from joining individually at these activities because it may not be in line with our educational value. So the school wants to manage and control those extracurricular activities. Can you stop it? And I may show you some uh, video of the, the international service trips that we had. First one um, to Thailand in year 2012. Can you? Well, they're enjoying uh, riding elephants. <laughs> this, this was their ex first experience riding uh, elephants. Maybe you can skip to the middle. So we combine some kind of entertainment and uh, education. So this is a uh, video clip that they visited a local school in Thailand. And they had some kind of activity with uh, local students here in Thailand. And including they help uh, cleaning the campus, uh, building some uh, extracurricular room, activity rooms and things like that in the rural area of Thailand. So maybe next. Next video. <laughs> and then we went to Vietnam in 2013.
Actually, this video was taken by uh, one of our students and edited by him. Local food was kind of first experience to them. And then I'll, uh, we went to Cambodia. Boy walks south down on the broken track. Father said, my son, can you move to the uh, middle of the video? So this, this is the, the similar activity they do, I mean, in every country, they participate in community service, helping them and experiencing construction and cleaning, something like that. And besides, uh, international service trips they go, uh, we encourage them to be responsible for local community. So, uh, especially in, on the island of Jeju, there are families, there are less privileged families, so that their children had no chance to speak to native speakers of English. So, our students, because of this international school, uh, they are perfectly bilingual, so we encourage them to, to participate in class with uh, local students to help them to practice English. And it was featured by a Korean uh, TV news. So, can you play this one? 아이들은 도심의 학생들과는 달리 영어 학원 한번 가는 것도 참 쉬운 일이 아니죠. 이런 아이들을 위해 매 주말마다 특별한 영어 교실이 열리는 곳이 있습니다. The title is a special English class. 영어 퀴즈에서 정답을 맞춘 아이들이 환호성을 지릅니다. You saw the fruit, a fruit that you eat. 온갖 몸동작을 동원한 영어 퀴즈에 아이들은 주저하지 않고 정답을 외칩니다. So the uh, middle school students are teaching English to uh, young young kids in the neighborhood. Besides of these, besides to these <coughs> international service trips, we also have some exchange programs with other academic institutions and organizations. And we have an agreement with Harvard University, so our KIS students can apply to Harvard Summer Program for expedited uh, admissions program so that uh, if students get a recommendation by KIS, then they can uh, uh, get an acceptance to Harvard Summer Program easily. And then we have a, a uh, sister school relationship with St. Mark's, for a couple of years, so our students visit St. Mark's, and St. Mark's students and teachers come and visit our school. And we just started the same program with Groton School in the U.S. And as many of you know about this organization, we are a member of your course, and we just joined the, uh, the organization called WORSA, it's World Leading Schools, Schools Association, and there are many members from American schools, UK schools, and Chinese schools. And KIS was one of the founding members of the uh, Association of International Schools in Asia. This is uh, photos of uh, students when they visited uh, St. Mark's last year. And you can see right bottom of the corner, you see students are jumping. That's not uh, St. Mark's, that's uh, MIT campus. St. Mark's is only like a 30 minutes away from uh, Boston. So our students, when they go to St. Mark's, 
besides staying in St. Mark's, but they visit other universities around Boston area, including like Harvard and MIT, and they, they visited MIT and they, they were very happy. <laughs> and maybe you just see the last video a little bit. This is the campus of uh, St. Mark's. It is over 100 years old, so very old campus by American standard. Coming to St. Mark's was a very uh, good opportunity for me to find what I'm interested in. We strongly this encourage KIC students in Jeju to go to St. Mark's, visit St. Mark's school because most of our students at Seoul campus, they are returning so that they have experience living outside Korea, but most of our Jeju students are local so that we oh, try to give an opportunity for them to get to know other culture, other people, and so and so. I guess you can watch the full video from the, uh, the CD-ROM that you received from the organizer. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you may visit our website for further information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Min. I think it's very interesting from the lesson learned from Japan that provide learning activity in classroom and also in some extra curriculum activity in school. But for kids from Korea, they provide some exchange program and uh, let the student learn to be to be the, to, to become the global citizen through the service learning program, not only in in Korea but in the foreign country. So the next one, a presenter from Taiwan will come and share her lesson learned from her school to provide opportunity to develop global citizenship to the young generation. So please welcome Miss Martina Chen from Taiwan. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for Miss Askan. Uh, to invite me over here, I am very surprised that I could be invited. Uh, I could be invited to represent uh, Taiwan School, and uh, our school is located in Tainan, and it's called uh, IBST at NNKIEH. Uh, let me briefly um, introduce uh, what NNKIEH is and what IBST is. Uh, Taiwan, uh, 30 years ago, Taiwan. Uh, has our first uh, industrial park, high-tech industrial park. Uh, it's the government-owned uh, uh, science park to help uh, uh, recruit foreign investors to invest in Taiwan. So that's why uh, 30 years ago, they have the first um, school uh, built up in a science park with international program in it. And 20 years later, it was uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2006, uh, there was also another science park uh, being built in Tainan area, Southern Taiwan. And we are the one that is in the Southern Tainan Science Park, uh, which also serves the function for the government to attract foreign investors to come to Southern Taiwan and then invest uh, high-tech companies in Taiwan. So uh, our largest company, uh, we have um, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Company. They have their largest uh, um, factory in Tainan Science Park. And we also have uh, some American companies um, from uh, the United States and they also invest in the Southern Tainan Science Park as well. So our school here, NNKIEH, is stands for uh, National Nanke. Nanke is Southern Tainan Science Park. National Nanke International Experimental High School. And the IBST is uh, our magnetic program called International Bilingual School at Tainan Science Park. So IBST is a small school within NNKIH. 
So that uh, we use IBST internationally because we are currently working on the accreditation. Uh, so we got, we got accredited, uh, by, we got granted by a candidacy status uh, in 2013. So next year will be our next uh, first uh, WASC uh, visit. Uh, as a new school, we are progressing quite well because we are only 10 years old. And this is our 10th year. So uh, we are tr uh, trying to be WASC accredited school like KIS is already. <laughs> and we are so young, so we are working on it now. And so next, uh, our school mandate is our school mission. Is uh, we try to um, provide um, North American curriculum to the Southern Taiwan Science Park um, uh, companies and then also help the government to recruit uh, foreign engineers to come back to Taiwan to work in the Southern Taiwan Science Park. And so we need to solve the problem of their kids' education. So we are assuming that they are coming back from Silicon Valley in the United States. Therefore, we choose a North American curriculum to be our program. So uh, this is uh, the major reason why our government invests uh, this bilingual program here in Southern Tainan Science Park. So in Taiwan, there are many international schools. They are mostly private or uh, American schools or uh, Morrison, like uh, with church uh, sponsored. But our school is uh, uh, fully sponsored by the government. And in Taiwan, there are only two schools like this, one in the north and one in the south. And so we are the one in the south and then the NNKIH, the, our mother school, has a total of 2,600 students, and they are, most of them are Taiwan local students. And their parents also work in a science park, but their parents are um, Taiwanese uh, engineers or workers in the Southern Tainan Science Park. While uh, we IBST the students, uh, we only have 140 students now um, because we have very strict admission policies that uh, only if you have been abroad with your family or your parents for at least one or two years or if your parents ha are the foreign hires, can you be qualified to uh, apply for our program. So that's why we only have 140 students from grade one to grade 12. So this is where we are, uh, Tainan, uh, here, okay? And the one, the other one, our sister school that founded 30 years ago was about here near Taipei. So we are the one here near Kaohsiung. So Tainan is the, uh, the oldest city in Taiwan. So uh, 400 years ago, uh, Dutch people arrived to uh, Taiwan and they uh, landed Taiwan from Tainan. So Tainan is actually the oldest city in Taiwan. Uh, we have a lot of temples, fort, uh, built, uh, the forts were built by Dutch people and even uh, Spanish people, they occupied Taipei for 20 years, a uh, long time ago. And then Dutch people uh, occupied Tainan uh, for uh, 40 years or, or so, a uh, long time ago. So we, uh, Tainan is full of culture. So if you are interested in Taiwan, you can visit Tainan first. Okay. Um, this is our school mission, as I mentioned. Uh, it's a highly selective because we only admitted we only admit uh, certain students, not all the students, or we don't consider their passport either. So only uh, serving for special functioning that uh, they are coming to work in the Tainan Science Park and they are from abroad and they have this need uh, of the bilingual uh, education. So uh, we are college preparatory magnet program affiliated to our mother school, National Nanka International Experimental High School. 
So we serve in as a, a journey southern Taiwan Science Park's goal of recruiting foreign nations, international talents, calling up on the best tradition of Taiwan's public and overseas nations, especially we emphasize on the United States and um, international school systems strive to provide an excellent education to create successful bilingual and bicultural individuals. So we implement uh, North American curriculum. However, we do teach them Taiwanese culture. So from our grade three to grade eight students, we also teach them Chinese social studies uh, two hours a week. And from grade one to grade 12, uh, we provide them five hours of Chinese classes. And the rest of the courses will be, uh, will be lectured in English and all the teachers and even local uh, Taiwanese teachers will be lecturing the classes in English except, except for the Chinese courses. So here is our um, expected school-wide uh, student learner goal. Uh, so we hope them to be a, autonomous, lifelong, lifelong learners, and they have to be self-aware, and we expect them to be a critical thinkers and problem solvers by themselves. And so they also have to be collaborative learners as well, and then we expect them to be able to build up effective communication skills and they have to be a responsible citizens. And then also, plus most important of all, they have to be the globally and cultural aware. So they have to be the global citizens. Because in the future, they are not gonna just work in Taiwan. We expect them to work abroad and then bring back the best to Taiwan. Okay, so this is our campus. Okay, uh, we have uh, about 10 acres. Um, um, for 2,600 students, and then most of them are elementary kids, and uh, I would say 40% are elementary kids, 20% uh, are junior high school kids, and then about 9% are the um, high school kids. So, and bilingual department only maybe um, <laughs> five, uh, less than five percent. Okay, so uh, this uh, the one you can see here is our gym, and our uh, we are very honored that our new campus are uh, well. Actually, it's quite new though. Uh, this campus is only uh, five years old, and then uh, we won the diamond green licensed uh, building in Taiwan. Uh, why we call it Diamond Green Licensed Building is because all uh, the equipment we use and then the environment uh, when we were trying to build this building, it's all uh, environmental uh, considered green. So even we try not to uh, create too much waste and then we use the uh, uh, um, environmental free um, uh, things to build the building and also we try to build the building with uh, nation, uh, considering the current and the wind and the uh, climate weather in Taiwan, how the wind blows so that we don't need air condition. So that's why we call uh, this uh, Diamond Green Licensed Building in Taiwan. So it's a very special building in Taiwan that uh, every year we have uh, more than a thousand <laughs> visitors come to visit our uh, school building. Yeah. And then this is our gym. Yeah, and then we don't need air con most of the time. So unless it's really, really hot in summer, other than that, the one you can see, uh, in this building here, uh, the school gym and the building behind, uh, the, that, was, that is our uh, classroom. Uh, they don't need uh, air con. Okay, Taiwan is really hot. Okay, uh, even now it's the same as Thailand. It's maybe 28 to 30 degree now. And then in these uh, classrooms, there's natural uh, uh, wind blow in and you don't need air con. So that's um, uh, one of our school uh, 
very proud of this uh, building. And so uh, this is our student body from our bilingual department. And then uh, we are especially uh, focused on debate. And then they, uh, uh, they are, we create a debate uh, team about five years ago, and then we were doing quite well uh, in Taiwan, and also we went to Japan last year for the debate competition. So total now we have 140 students and then uh, 26 teachers and then 13 of them are Taiwan's uh, local teachers who are able to speak English and then 13 Western teachers and most of them are from the United States and one of them is from Canada. Okay, so uh, every year we recruit uh, Western teachers and then uh, Bangkok is also one of the places we will come to recruit teachers. So this is all our students and teachers. And so we took this picture, I think, last year. So it was uh, pretty neat that uh, this is the main entrance of our school. And then we, you, as you can see, um, if you look at a student and a teacher's ratio, it's quite low. Uh, like five to one. So every student can be well taken in our school. Yeah. So this is the textbook that we use. As I mentioned before that we use a North American curriculum, especially we earlier in from year one to year seven, I think we especially using uh, Hofton Mifflin and uh, they are, and we followed California curriculum standard. Uh, however, now the United States is switching from, um, uh, each state has their own standard to common core. So we are also trying to switch from the California standard to common core standard. So now it's called uh, California common core. So we, we will also update our textbook uh, recently and then gradually. So uh, here are all our steps. You can see it's uh, very um, diversified uh, by culture. So half of them are Taiwanese local teachers. They are all uh, having uh, English capability to lecture the courses in English. And uh, half of them are uh, foreign, foreign teachers, foreign hires. And then they are all lecture, all kind of classes. Um, uh, we lecture math in English as well. Even if we are Taiwanese teachers, we still lecture math in English. Okay, and then um, we require our Chinese teachers, our Taiwanese teachers to be able to lecture class in English. And they are all licensed uh, Taiwanese government teacher. And then uh, the foreign hires, we also require them uh, to have, at least they need to have bachelor's degree from an English speaking country. Also, they need to have the valid teaching license in the area or the subjects they are going to teach. So 70% uh, of our Westerners host, uh, hold a master's degree. And then currently, we, uh, in these pictures, we have two doctors. And then uh, one doctor, uh, they left uh, this semester. But in this picture, we still have two doctors there. And most 100% uh, of the Taiwanese teacher, they own a master's degree. So we, uh, I would not say we are a very high-tech school, uh, but at least uh, in each classroom, we have projector and computer, and the internet is usually a problem even in a, a science park. Uh, so uh, every teacher, the school give them a computer, so, in, and we also equipped computer to each classroom so that uh, there is no problem if you want to use uh, YouTube or if, if you want to have them uh, watch video or do a project, a PowerPoint project. And I recently have my uh, social studies uh, classroom students to do a green project. And that is talking about Taiwan's green energy. 
and then I upload it to YouTube. I have my student first try. Okay, they try to upload their video to the YouTube. In the past, we only have students do PowerPoint presentation in classroom. So there's only the class, their classmates can see their presentation. But after I encourage them to upload their uh, video to YouTube, now they can share it around the world. So I think this is the new try to us, although I know it's not new in the world, because now the world is all talking about flipping classroom and other uh, people they can upload, and also Khan Academy, also TED. So there are so many uh, internet resources, but uh, uh, we are still having some concern about internet learning, so we are trying. Although we are still falling behind on, on the internet learning, but we are trying uh, our best to see what we can do. Uh, because sometimes uh, we think that uh, to have the students to spend all the time on, online will uh, have some influence on their interaction with uh, their, uh, uh, their classmates or their parents, so we don't want them to spend too much time on internet, but we are trying, okay? And in our school, we don't allow them to use cell phones, yeah? We still have, we still remain Taiwanese culture in our school, and they have to do cleaning, they have to clean the uh, bathroom as well, so that's uh, why we are a bilingual department, so we have some, something really Western, and then we still conserve our Taiwanese culture as well. So activities we do, including uh, debate, uh, model United Nations, and WSC World Scholar Cup, and we are doing quite well in these three areas. And um, we also have our students host uh, English summer camp for the elementary kids in urban area, uh, in suburban area or in countryside. So I started this program three years ago that every summer and winter, we have our Nanka Interact. It's a rotary uh, organization and the rotary will uh, give them some support and they will go to some uh, small elementary school and they don't have much resources. The kids there cannot learn English. Uh, they don't have that many chances to learn English. So we bring uh, a group of kids, uh, they are from grade nine to grade 12, and they do community service and then they organize everything. So the students learn to be the leader and they plan everything. They do write their lesson plan and they create games. So they bring all this to the elementary school. So uh, this is the fourth year they are going to do it and we have been to four or five different elementary schools around Taiwan. So they are quite proud of themselves and we are proud of them, our students too. So we have a soccer team, uh, you know as a School with 140 students only to form a soccer team is really crazy because then almost all the seniors are grade 7 to grade 12. Uh, maybe 80% of them have to be in a soccer team. So, And then our students are super busy because with 50 students from grade 9 to grade uh, 12, they have to do debate, they have to do MUN, they have to do WSC, and then they have to uh, participate in soccer, and they have to participate in a community service. So they are learning everything in a short time. And so they enjoy it a lot, and we try our best to let them have a stage, to provide them a stage. So finally is our year end performance. Every year we have the students to host uh, whatever they want to perform. So we give them like an, a whole afternoon. So in that whole afternoon is they uh, prepare everything and then uh, they, they may have musical performance and then they have 
they may have art exhibition, they may sing a song, they may have a drama. So this, is, this has been our tradition for 10 years. So starting from our first year, we have a year-end performance for them. So it's the day that the students can show what they have learned in the year. So, and also our student council, they host a prom, graduation prom by themselves. So they have to go contact the hotel and then they have to, to prepare all the stuff for the prom. And then, so it's all uh, the activities that are hosted by students themselves and then they learn how to do or how to deal with the real life problem by themselves. Even selling the tickets, advertisement, are all done by the students. So they also invite uh, students from other school, so and then also sell the ticket to them in order to fund their prom uh, activities. So we are uh, we are quite proud of our students, even if we are a small group, but they are certainly doing a lot of things. So this is one thing that our teacher do with the student. You can see that is a world map. And then uh, this art teacher was with us for two years. And then he wanted to paint a big wall and with wall map. And then uh, by the end, uh, when it finished, uh, there were Taiji Maha, there were a pyramid, and there were um, the world map. And then with the world map, you will see a different uh, symbol of the world. And you see Great Wall in China, and you will see a Japanese uh, temple. And then you see many different uh, uh, special things uh, on that map. And it's only done uh, in two weeks. So, and teachers and students finish it together. So it's still there, okay. So that is um, uh, one of the special things you want to see if you visit our school, although we are small. So these are the pictures of our year end performance. The first picture is the year end performance that uh, lower grade kids, they are singing. And then the second picture is uh, we hosted uh, WSDC tryouts in our school. It's a uh, 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 debate camp. So uh, we hosted it in Taiwan in our school. So all the international school students in Taiwan who do English debate come to our school and then they have one week camp first. And then after the camp, uh, they have the uh, tryout, and then so they, se they select national team. So um, after they are selected in the national team, they will have another week of camp to train them to join the international debate. So uh, we first time joined a world, uh, world debate camp, and it, it was last year. Uh, so this was hosted in our school. So we are very famous of debate in Taiwan. Okay. And here is our sports day. And we have sports day every year. And then it's a very important event in Taiwan. So um, we, we consider it an activity that bring everybody together. And last picture is the, we hosted a professional development. So uh, we have in-house PD for our teachers because uh, Taiwan's government, they only support uh, free uh, PD, professional development to Taiwanese local teachers. So as a government school in Taiwan, without any resources that we cannot provide any PD, Therefore, we have, we have to uh, try to find any of the professional uh, teachers to come to our school and to host PD for us. Yeah, so, uh, I, and that is the visit from WASC um, Executive Director, Dr. Debbie Brown in 2002 and our MUN team last year. Yeah, and we also have our school newspaper Okay, and these are the performance of our AP score. I guess um, uh, KIS has much better score. 
uh, <laughs> we have, uh, but we are growing though from, uh, we also offer AP courses and uh, KIS um, also has um, AP courses and we do too. And then our grades are growing every year. So now the average is 4.1 and then uh, many subjects are taken. And students working really hard. And we, uh, this year we have one, one student get a uh, full score, 2,400 SAT. And then two students won National Merit Scholarship in the last uh, five graduation classes. Yeah, and this is our SAT's performance, 1915, uh, uh, 1915. Yeah, that's for the five years uh, average. Uh, 2012 to 2014, yeah. But uh, considering the small numbers, I think it's not too bad. And then uh, college acceptance, you cannot read it very well, but uh, we have st students yeah, go to Dartmouth, uh, Cornell, accepted a full scholarship, and then also we have students got admitted to UC Berkeley and many other schools as well. So Google us, IBST at NNKH Tainan, Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martina. <laughs> it's so interesting that you use the performing arts and also the art project to promote the global citizenship. Uh, and the last but not least, I'm so, so sorry that we have got the limit of time for 15 minutes. So I will take the microphone to Kumpe Chuda, uh, Prayun from Amnoy Sin School in Thailand to share her lesson learned. Uh, from the school-based practice to promote the global citizenship education. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, here comes Thailand. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for inviting me um, to this event and having Amnoy Sin School representing Thai schools for one of the best practice in in Asia, so where do I? Okay, sorry. How do we go back? This one. Okay, All right. Thank you. Um, the school, we are Amnoy Sin School, um, was established in 1926. We are uh, celebrating our 90th anniversary next year. The founder was um, a teacher from Son Kulab School, and he was a teacher of English. So English has always been the, one of the um, outstanding uh, subjects uh, we provided in the school at that time. Apart from, the being, you know, from, from being the teacher, the owner had the advantage of recruiting the best teachers, and so academic achievement was one of the key success at the beginning time of the school. But then, one of the most um, important focus of the schools had always been um, that we provide holistic education. And during that time, we did have music, um, we did have art um, and morale, our ethical training were done through a lot of um, scouts activities and other um, extra curricula as well. We all, always cling to the Thai philosophy, I think it's Thai or Buddhist philosophy about education, which we call Puti Siksa, Jariya Siksa, Hatha Siksa, and Pala Siksa. Um, today, the three of the, the three domains are uh, knowledge, skills, and attribute. And the fourth one that we focus in Thai education at that time was also physical development. For today's education, we now focus uh, a lot more on skills rather than knowledge. And one of the most skill, uh, important skills that we think um, is very important for preparing global citizen for tomorrow's world is um, to, to, to train them to be able to communicate, communicate effectively. 20 years ago, we started um, introducing um, teaching of English by native speakers. It was just a subject, but over time, 
we converted to become a um, bi curricular school. So we deliver Thai and UK curricula in one combined curriculum. And in 19, sorry, in, in 2009, um, we became Thailand's first bilingual school under the Ministry of Education to, to become the University of Cambridge um, International Examination Center. Apart from the skills and knowledge in the curriculum, uh, what we do train students um, our learning skills because there will be new knowledge, new technology, and new jobs in the future. So we, apart from, from teaching the knowledge, we now have to focus on teaching them the skills to learn new knowledge. Um, and that's through all means, all senses, and all sources. So we provide different kinds of learning experience, such as Montessori and project-based approach in, um, throughout the school from the nursery to year 13. We do also focus on life skills to prepare global citizens for the 20, 21st century. Um, and the project approach, we can um, integrate issues uh, which are more current and involve global issues such as poverty, um, sustainable economy, or um, um, things such as religion, pluralism, things like that can be integrated in our projects which run through from, again, nursery to year 13. Apart from that, we focus also on working together, working in collaboration. So we don't have classrooms of 60s with students sitting, sitting in rows. Uh, the maximum number of students we have is 24. And what they do most of the time in class, um, exchanging ideas um, and, and learning from each other. So we introduce the, the, the uh, what we call is approach, another approach called thinking schools approach, which focus on um, using thinking skills as the pedagogy for deliver, delivering the contents. Um, we started off with uh, working in collaboration with King School in New Zealand to train teachers to become teachers of thinking. And then we, we later on started working with the consulting, consulting company in the UK um, to train our teachers um, and transform the whole school. Um, and through processes that we involved throughout the seven years, we got accredited by the University of Exeter to become the first thinking school in Asia. And become, being a thinking school, um, Many, of, many people ask, what is a thinking school? And we try to engage every member of our community in thinking. This means teachers, students, parents, and people, staff working in the school. We all value thinking in our community. And we, have, we share common approach in thinking. We do share uh, thinking tools um, and the way we think is um, set up in, in one same pattern throughout the school. So it's called thinking school, which is a whole school approach. And now, in the 21st century, we still base our education mostly on holistic uh, principle. And this day, the, the world has become so globalized and trying to retain local traditions and culture has become a challenge for schools today. So um, that was one of the reasons we decided to remain um, a Thai and UK curriculum school and not an international school because that gives us more room to integrate Thai values and culture into um, 
the more international education that we are providing to students. And I think that it is very important that to become a global citizen, people have to also um, be, um, uh, to have self-esteem, uh, can have self-identity, and still um, act in, in a way that um, represents their, their nationality, their eth ethnic, ethnicity, and uh, the value of their culture. So I think that's, um, that's one of the things that we can integrate into our project work as well. Having said all these things about holistic education, physical development, um, 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 language and communication, Yet, we still achieve a very high performance in the national examinations. Um, t I think last year was the second year that we, we got the highest score in year 10 on its examination uh, among private schools. And for three sec consecutive years, we have um, received the highest IGCSE awards in in especially coordinated science, which is a dual award subject, um, as well as math, English first language, and Thai first language. Um, so you can be assured that with the evidence that academic performance um, may, may be um, one of your strengths in the school, alongside with other activities such as thinking, projects, um, which helps to um, nurture young people to become global citizens for the 21st century. Um, this also, I'm going to say now, um, provide training for uh, schools in Malaysia, um, in Thailand, we are, we are working with a school in Drang to train them to become a thinking school as well. Um, so, if any school is interested, you may want to go to Amnoisin School website and find out how to get in touch with the people involved who can help you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shuda, for a brief presentation. Uh, at the last five minutes, I have got one question for each to, to, to share the perspective. We start with a colleague from Japan. Uh, I have one question how can we help? our students to maintain their own identity, whereas we try to promote them to adjust themselves to the global culture. And the same question to the friend from Taiwan. Okay. So, the que so the question is concerning preserving identity at the same time as developing a sense of international mindedness and global citizenship. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, look, myself, I, I, yesterday's speaker was talking about um, European identity, and he was talking about Asia, the Asian identity. And that resonated with me, because I consider myself to be English, and I consider myself to be British, and I consider myself to be European. I also consider myself to be a global citizen, and I consider my home to be Japan. And all of those are important to me. And if you took any one of those away from me, I would not feel the person that I feel today. And so in our schools, we absolutely have to value uh, the perspective, again, of where we come from and how that shapes us. And I don't believe you can become internationally minded without understanding the national. You know, you can't be international without national. Now, obviously, in my school, that looks very different because my kids have 35 different senses of national. And so what that looks like in the curriculum is going to be very different than a school here in Thailand where your, your kids all are Thai. And so you're going to be developing that real sense of being Thai through the curriculum. But it's going to go beyond that, of course. So what does that mean to be Thai within Asia? What does that mean to be Thai within the world? And so that's why I keep coming back to all of this has to start in the classroom. And sometimes in education, we look at the strategy or we look at the, the, the visible thing 
and then we assume that that is all there is. And we heard this morning about cleaning in Japan. So cleaning is a strategy to help children understand about identity and purpose and individual and group and responsibility and that, that whole child. And so you can't just pick these isolated events, have a global citizens day, um, take kids off to a, a trip overseas, take kids here, take kids there. You can't do that unless you have a deeper model that starts in the classroom, that starts with kids understanding perspective, understanding identity, understanding who they are. And that needs skillful teachers to really pose questions of children so that they begin to look at things in new ways and they begin to understand that perspective has validity um, and we can look at the same thing and see something different and be right. So what that looks like in your school is going to be different to my school, but I think that is what connects us. Thank you so much. And the same question to the Matt Martina, how to make balance between the global citizen and the national identity. Yeah. Okay, um, in our school, uh, we are always having conflicts uh, about which value should we value the best. For example, uh, we have so many um, American teachers and they try to make our student, educate our student in American way. And while the whole environment is a local, traditional Taiwanese environment. So, uh, for example, we have nap time and nap time would be 40 minutes, and then Western teachers would think that's a waste of time. And then in Taiwan, we think it's necessary. So uh, we, so many examples, and we are not that punctuative, while Americans, they are very punctuative. And then uh, we are more tolerant, and American teachers, they are very consistent, and then they are, not that tolerant to the students. They value the, um, the rules and they want to maintain consistency. While in Taiwan, we think, okay, each case is, is different. So enormous of conflicts been going on for 10 years. So I concluded that first of all, we have to give everybody a chance to understand each other first. So also, if you can have your kids or the teachers to meet with teacher, uh, teachers or students from many different countries that will help them to understand that uh, Western culture or Taiwanese culture is not the only culture available. You need to know that each country is different. So first of all, you have to give them the chance to understand each other. And second, I think you need to be sincere. You need to really open your heart to accept those differences. There's nothing right or wrong, but there's just mutual understanding. So being sincere is very important if you want to have very good cultural communication. And finally, I would say that respect. So you respect each culture. So finally, you will come to a consensus how to solve the cultural conferences. And I am in the position that it, right in the middle, my boss and boss's boss from the science park, they are all Taiwanese thinking. And then my teachers, half of them are Chinese, uh, or I would say Taiwanese teachers. And with very, uh, they, they may not have that much um, exposure to um, Western societies, and half of them are from Western countries. So I have to deal with the top management and then the, my teachers too, and so, so does students. So I think understanding, sincerity, and respectations would be the major key. Thank you so much for Martina. And the second question for the friend from Korea, I asked, what is the priority to school teacher to help develop skill and characteristic to a young generation to become the global citizen? Well, I, I think most important thing is in, in terms of ability, the, the communication skill. So in our case, uh, the medium of uh, uh, teaching is in English. So uh, most of my uh, students are perfectly bilingual in English and Korean. But more importantly, I think willingness 
is more important uh, than ability. That is, uh, let me just put it this way. Even if you are able to understand and communicate in different culture, you cannot be perform well unless you are willing to work with other people. So I think the priority should be how to teach children to work willing to be work with others. That's, that's the priority. And so in many cases, my, my teachers try to put children in a situation that they are forced to work with others so that they have to learn how to work with others. So that, that's, the, I guess, the priority in global education. Thank you so much. And the last question for Kun Peshuda. Uh, because the chair from Thailand, I would like to, to uh, invite you to recommend some recommendation for Thai school, how to internationalize the school culture to nurture to nurturing uh, uh, characteristic of the global citizen to young generation. Um, if you still um, um, operate as a hundred percent Thai school. Um, I think many schools are already moving towards preparing students to become global citizens. But I think Thailand, we have to start with the teachers. Educating teachers about um, global, global um, culture, global language such as, such as uh, English, um, and in education, the world in teaching and learning has moved forward and we have to be able to catch up with the new um, approach in education. So I think start with the teacher is the best way for, for educate, uh, preparing the new generation to become global citizens for Thailand. Thank you so much. Back to the key issue on the teacher education program uh, in service training program in school. And I think for two, today's session is very crucial. Uh, for one, one hour and a half, we learn from uh, four lessons from Japan, from Taiwan, Korea, and also from Thailand. Global citizenship is not only about the language, but it's about culture, it's about the uh, value and some skill that promote how to respect other, how to live in together with other. And I think it's an important thing and important theme for Thai school now because it's a key issue ar around the world. And finally, I would like to invite you all to give a big hand for the four presenters from four countries for their presentation and the perspective. And I would like to return the microphone to the MC. Thank you. Thank you for the speakers and moderator. Now I would like to call upon Associate Professor Dr. Nawanit Songkram to kindly present a token of appreciation to our panelists and the moderator. First token goes for Mr. Matthew Parr. And second for Dr. Sun Shik Min. Go for Miss Martina Sao Won Shun. And for the last panelist is Miss Keshida Ge Prayun. And for our moderator, Associate Professor Atapon at Nantawara Sakun.